Hello and welcome back to the ROI channel, the channel that's obsessed with the art and science of return on investment. Uh, today we're looking at a, we're doing a stock analysis from uh, one of the viewers, Lucas, who has been asking me for quite a while to give my thoughts on Nokia. Now it's important to say this is not advice, uh, this is just purely, everything on this channel is my opinion, my views, what I look to uh, to see in, t in regards to personal investment, uh, and I also also run a fund on eToro. So I'm just uh, letting people know what I do with my investment processes and uh, a small amount of that is actually managing money uh, on a eToro portfolio, which you can find in the link in the description below. Today we're gonna look at the company Nokia. Thank you to those who have subscribed already to the YouTube channel. If you haven't already done so, I would greatly appreciate that. And if you are following us on eToro uh, or if you're an investor already copying on eToro, thank you for your confidence in my abilities we have done uh, far better than the market and uh, dare I say it some other uh, very well-known investors so uh, I am aiming to to keep up the performance moving forward and this will be a, a prime example uh, using the case of Nokia as to some of the methods I use that have so far uh, enabled us to to do quite well alrighty so our crassest investment formula if I'm looking for a portfolio uh, core position or position to be in the uh, the crassest portfolio and it's going to make up a large percentage of the fund I need it to have a low debt a high margin of safety sales growth strong margins free cash flow growth and a history ideally of share buybacks that's the ultimate if I can get those uh, then I start to look at okay this is a quality business and the last question is uh, what's it worth versus the price it's currently uh, trading Okay, some quick facts on the company Nokia. Nokia is a very interesting company. It's been around for ages, as you probably know. They're not the company they used to be. We're gonna talk about that. Listed uh, on the Finnish exchange, uh, the revenue expected for 2021 is just a tick under 23 uh, billion euro. I'll use euro um, for the stock uh, ticker. It does have an American listing. I'm going to go through and give the facts in euros. I noticed that I did my uh, normal projections with the dollar sign because it's just the, the template, but make no mistake about it, we're talking euro throughout the entire video. EBITDA is expected to come in at 3.5 billion, okay. Uh, market cap of 28.6 billion euro. You'll see the top line revenue it's showing that it hasn't grown much. But what this business is, is a turnaround play. So it was actually losing money, going nowhere, and it was basically a company in decay. Pekalon Mark has come on board in charge of turning around the business and has said, look, you need to give me at least 18 months to two years before we can start to course correct. And uh, the numbers show that they are starting to do that. So you see the margins are actually growing. Enterprise value at 25 billion euros. So the company has more cash on hand than its outstanding uh, liabilities. Price uh, is five euro and seven cents. Shares, 5.6 billion shares. They've been flat on buyback, so they haven't issued any shares, nor have they repurchased any. The return on capital uh, for the five-year average is 10%, which is not bad for a company of their size. They have a negative net debt, and uh, interestingly, they've got about 8 billion euros in cash and cash equivalents. Okay, So they've got... Uh, Short-term instruments uh, and cash makes up about eight billion uh, in their their till to which they can uh, draw and use towards other uh, investment purposes as the management deems fit. So that that is a huge amount of optionality on that cash, and it's something that you should keep in mind for this type of business. Let's take a look at the price action over the last year. So they've done quite well. Uh, I actually bought uh, in an outside account before I was on eToro. I did have a small amount of Nokia shares and I sold out here when we had this, uh, uh, I believe it was a gamma squeeze from the Wall Street bets. And so it was a ridiculous amount of money um, that it uh, increased and then subsequently fell off a cliff on the other side. And I decided to sell out then. Uh, quality business and it hasn't really um, piqued my interest since because I've had uh, other opportunities. So here uh, you can see the, the history, okay? So we've got a 20 year history um, and you'll see as Nokia started to lose its market share, all of a sudden you had the iPhone and, um, and other technologies come onto the market uh, against which Nokia had to compete. Nokia didn't do a very good job, if truth be told, and so they lost a hell of a lot of their market share in the phone hardware and communication services that they offer. We're gonna see how that's no longer an issue for Nokia because they really don't compete um, 
in phone hardware and communications uh, like they used to, they're very much a, a different business now moving into in the future. So interesting uh, history. And I think that there's probably a, a bit of unfair sentiment around Nokia in the sense that it used to be who we all still kind of kind of think Nokia is. You know, you're playing uh, the 3210 Snake, um, you know, the brick mobile phone and all that sort of thing. But they're, they're, they're not involved in and they're not interested in um, bringing out a new phone to compete with Samsung or, or uh, Apple for that matter. They're looking more into uh, the network of things. So they're a turnaround play, completely new business, uh, not a new company, but you, you want to think of this as a new business model. They're not the same phone company they used to be. The main driving arm now, uh, as far as I can tell, is they're developing a 5G networks with strategic partners, which is a good idea and it's uh, a great space to play in if they can pull it off. They just turned cash flow positive last year. So that's when a lot of eyes started to be drawn towards Nokia. They were loss making and then uh, uh, April this year, sorry, speaking 20, uh, 2021, they actually were cash flow positive and so the market started to take, pay a bit more attention. EBITDA beat by 367%. However, they were expecting basically uh, basically nothing. So it doesn't take much to beat nothing uh, by, by 367%. Uh, but it is, it is interesting. It, it gives credence to the idea that Pekka Lundmark is the guy that has turned the business around and those, uh, those key metrics, which one would follow if one were interested in um, uh, Nokia as a stock, it would be in certainly encouraging to see that. Uh, EBITDA margins compounded uh, annual growth rate is starting to are starting to increase. They have, as well as the cash, the optionality on the cash, you also have optionality on three and a half thousand patents that uh, I'm told are declared as essential to 5G. I'm not an expert on 5G, it's why I haven't invested uh, since in Nokia, but I'm told that these patents are really, really important to the network of things when it comes to 5G. And that's going to be an interesting competitive advantage if Nokia can really um, make the most of that. Let's go into that a little bit deeper. So looking at the quarterly reports, uh, their Reef Shark is a, an AI technology they have that's used to power their 5G stations. Okay. Now, uh, it's around 44% of sales as of this year, and Nokia are forecasting that they can get that up to 70% of sales. So this is very, very interesting and important because it kind of, in a weird way, reminds me of a business we have here in Australia called Altium. They are, they're a different business. They're an electronic circuit board manufacturer. And the reason why that's important is they will supply these um, circuitry boards um, to their 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 clients, their customers, and it's a very sticky business. Okay, it's it's basically a, a SaaS, you know, software as a service business using a, a, a chip um, a circuitry board, which is a you know, obviously it's not a software, it's a hardware. But the way in which the business operates in terms of subscriptions uh, has meant that it's been an extremely uh, high performing stock. This is as far as I can tell, a similar idea because you would assume that once you have a, a customer using this Reef Shark, then your station is unlikely to change. And this was the thing with Altium was their, their, their clients, their systems then only spoke the language of Altium. So Altium's uh, circuit boards had their own language that, um, it, it, that gave them a competitive moat, meaning that if you set up your systems to use Altium circuitry, you couldn't then just easily replace Altium's boards with another brand because it was a different language. And so if you wanted to switch from Altium to a competitor, you would have to, um, as my understanding, reprogram your entire system, which is obviously a real pain in the butt and no one really wants to use that. I don't know uh, for sure if that's the case with the Reef Shark technology, but if it is, that's obviously a huge competitive advantage. Apparently, this uh, Reef Shark lowers energy usage by about 40 to 50%. Okay, so that would be obviously advantageous uh, from a unique selling proposition uh, point of view. They have 165 g deals under wraps, 63 are in active deployment. Okay, so they've got to work. They really have. They've got these strategic partnerships, they've got the contracts done, and now they're starting to roll it out. So, so far from a management execution point of view, I don't think you could really fault Nokia. Nokia is engaged in 60 trial periods where it's competing to win the contract. So I don't know what their win rate uh, is 
expected to be but presumably if they continue to have a, a high conversion rate they can really start to rack up these 5g deals and if it is the case that these these revenues these customer revenues are very sticky this is obviously a huge compounding base upon which they can uh, can build in the future Nokia will have a fav favorable win rate, apparently, as others try to compete with Reef Shark. Okay, so things uh, from people in the know seem to be uh, looking favorably for Nokia, and it'll be interesting to see how they roll out this um, opportunity. I think it's a huge growth opportunity. The question will be uh, how well can they execute, and at what price can we buy the shares? How do we value it? So I, I'm all in for the quality of this uh, opportunity, but how much am I paying for that? So let's take a look. If we look out into uh, 2023, the free cash flow per share, actually this is 2022, my, my apologies. Free cash flow per share, EBITDA per share, and earnings per share on the left-hand column have been calculated using analyst expectations. The multiples, uh, which I'll explain a little further in a moment, are in the middle. And then obviously the product of the two gives us our implied price for each uh, appropriate uh, input. Then I take a uh, equally weighted average and we get uh, 5 euro and 35 uh, euro cents, which uh, based on the current trading price of 5 euro and 7 cents is only about you know a 5% upside. So it, it's fairly priced in, in terms of what the market expects their growth to be into the next year. Uh, got a question from a copier, from an investor who wanted to know what I like to use in terms of deciding the multiples okay how do i come up with a, a multiple number which is a good question it does depend unfortunately there is no cookie cutter recipe upon which we can always rely however with valuations this is a, a bit of a special case i wouldn't use nokia versus the industry median because its competitors could be obviously very different businesses it might put you against apple which is not so much a network company as it is a, a hardware software and communications company same deal with Samsung and so we need to exclude that and just look at Nokia as it is historically again this is not uh, this is hardly perfect because Nokia is a different business from where it was five uh, and ten years ago however we've got to start somewhere so if we look at the means over the last decade or so that might give us a good starting point so as you'll see here you've got the ev to ebitda the pe and the market cap to free cash flow you've got the highs the lows and the means okay so what I've done is i've used that as a guide and then i've used my own discretion based on what i know on the business do i haircut it and trim it down or do i beef it up because i think it's uh it's not fully reflective of the quality of the company. So this is in this particular case, how I would use uh, multiple valuations for Nokia. If it were a different company in which there were some other competitors, like uh, for example, if I was looking at Micron versus the other semiconductor manufacturers around the world, I would just use the industry medium because it would, there are closer and more analogous competitors, if that makes sense. Healthcare at the moment is another opportunity in which you, you could use that. Okay, so let's take a look out uh, further into the, the into the future. Let's take the historic growth rates and let's use the uh, historic mean uh, multiples for EBITDA, free cash flow, and earnings per share. And then I've also dialed it up for the bull case and dialed it down for the bear case, as you you'll see I so often do. We apply a probability uh, weighting and then we times the probability of each scenario by the present value of the cash flows expected okay and then we add those together and we get a uh, intrinsic value weighted between the three likely scenarios so we're going to have our normal scenario which we call the base case we've got a bull case if things go uh, a little bit more more positively and then obviously we need to account for the fact that inevitably things aren't always going to plan so we need to have a margin of safety and think about a bear case what happens if the growth doesn't occur what happens if the multiples are fairly low and so we do that for uh, using EBITDA free cash flow and earnings as our inputs and then we get an intrinsic value of three euro and 62 cents okay normally i would like to see even a, a margin of safety on that so i would say okay can i buy the shares at two-thirds of that intrinsic value which in this case would be two euro and 39 cents 
And if you're wondering what I use for a discount rate, I use 20%. The reason I use 20% is because um, I'm quite picky and I want a high discount rate. I want a 20% expected annualized rate of return for me to want to venture into the capital markets. That's just the way that I am. You don't have to do that. You can use 7% or 10%, which are numbers that are co commonly used and then apply your own margin of safety. Completely up to you. This is what works for me. I'm not changing it, <laughs> okay? Uh, okay. That obviously is a long way below where the stock is currently trading. And you might look at this and say, yeah, but Ben, you're looking more historically uh, in terms of coming up with your metrics. You're not really uh, taking into account the growth opportunity that this company has. And you, you could be right uh, in that case. Uh, so what I've done is a, a separate calculation. And I've said, what if this company can hit double digit growth rates in its base case for the next 10 years? Okay. Uh, it's quite possible. So uh, what I've put in here is obviously 10% uh, in each of the, the base and the bull case, and then left the bear case as if the company was growing just slightly above GDP. Okay. Everything else is the same. I've done this for all the, uh, the inputs that I use, free cash flow, EBITDA and earnings per share. And so we say, okay, well, what would that give us if we were to do a thought experiment? We'd expect an intrinsic value in that case of around about four euro. Okay, so this is the way that I like to look at things. This is why I have outperformed others when the market has sold off because I, I am really picky about the multiples at which I will pay for a company. So I think a lot of people have not necessarily got sucked into a, a narrative about Nokia's growth, it could be a, a, ludicru a lucrative, uh, ludicrously lucrative opportunity for them, but you know I, I, I'm skeptical. I want to see, um, you know, I want to see a business that I find easy to value, and by definition, looking into the future and saying what growth at what growth rate can this company acquire these new 5G deals and their contracts? I don't know how to calculate that. Okay, if someone else does, that's great. Um, but looking, the, inf the future is inherently uncertain. And I believe part of the reason why we have captured far less of the downturn in the, uh, at the end of November and start of December in 2021 is because I've looked uh, at the easier opportunities. It's as simple as that. Charlie Munger talks about, look, he doesn't buy into every business. He doesn't even try to calculate the intrinsic value of every business. If he looks at a business and he can't work out what their growth rate's gonna be and he can't work out how the model's gonna work, he just simply puts it in the too hard basket and waits for something else to come along. And so in a, a fairly a fairly rosy scenario here, we can say that Nokia is still trading above my estimate of their intrinsic value. Now, yes, I am fairly conservative and apply a large margin of safety to this, but I think that you know I would rather have the market come to me as opposed to me adjusting my expectations um, to conform with a, a self-serving bias that I have about any particular company. And if I were to do that, if I were to go in, and this is a mistake I see a lot of investors make, and say, oh, but what if I just change the discount rate to 10%? And what if I don't need a, a two thirds margin of safety? What if I just need, you know, 90% and, and so on and so forth. You can see where I'm going with this. Adjust the growth rate, adjust the, the multiples. Well, if you do that, the, <laughs> what the hell's the point of, you know, why don't you just buy the stock without even looking at a, a calculation, okay? <laughs> it's gonna, you're gonna come to the same conclusion. And so I, I hope that that helps outline um, how my process has helped me and my investors that are copying the portfolio on eToro to avoid uh, some of the drawdowns that other people have. We're, we're gonna have drawdowns, but if we're outperforming the market on the downside, that's just as important as outperforming on the upside. Here we uh, look at an IRR. So if I bought the shares today at five euro and seven cents, and I got their expected cash flows over time, uh, discounted at a 5% uh, discount rate, which is their working average cost of capital, then we get an IRR of 12.4%. Okay, so that's in line with, uh, I mean, in this environment with the amount of liquidity that's being pumped through most um, civilized stock exchanges around the world, you wouldn't, you wouldn't bother with the idiosyncratic risk of one company versus just buying the broad index is gonna get you a, you know, there or thereabouts, a 12.5% return. So it's not at this price, at least, it's not worth the risk for me to step over the risk line and go further up the risk curve 
take on the risk of an individual company. I don't think it's a risky company. I just think it's a risky investment at this price in terms of uh, me defining that as uh, keeping or improving um, my returns over time and not losing purchasing power. Okay, I, I prob you're probably not going to lose money uh, with this company at this price, but you're also not going to outperform the market. So why bother take the risk on one company when you could just buy the broad index? If we do the same thing uh, for the EBITDA, uh, exactly the same discount rate, the IRR is a little better. Uh, it's expected to be around 16%. Maybe that's good enough for you. For me, it's not. Uh, I, I, I like the company. I like the opportunity. If it were to uh, be caught up in a broad sell-off, then I'd be interested. Okay. So my verdict for me personally, uh, I, I'm, I'm watching. I'm keeping an eye on the company and I'm waiting, but I'm not willing to pull the trigger, at least not yet. It is a quality company, however, in my opinion. It's got low debt. The margin of safety in terms of the cash on the balance sheet is there. The margin of safety in terms of the price relative to its intrinsic value, in my opinion, is not there yet. So we would need to see that. Sales growth is picking up, okay, since, if you look at it, since Packer Lamarck has taken over, they're doing a good job. Before, obviously, they were stagnant, but they are starting to get these contracts um, uh, really underway, which is interesting. Margins are good, uh, and I think they'll continue to improve. The free cash flow growth is there, but again, only since the turnaround of Packer Lamarck, so there's not a long history of us, um, it, for us to be confident and to rely upon. And share buybacks, will they buy back some shares? They could, they have a hell of a lot of cash uh, on the balance sheet, but it's yet to be seen. So interesting, but for me, I'm just gonna keep an eye on it. And I may find space in the portfolio if it, we have a huge sell-off, depending on what else is available. So thanks for watching. Uh, if you'd like to uh, add us to watch list on eToro to, get, to keep your eye on how the portfolio is performing, uh, or if you've got funds and you wanna invest in a value and growth fund that has uh, done well so far and will continue to do so, all you need to do is click on the link, download the eToro app if you don't have it already, transfer your funds, choose an amount, and then hit the copy button. That's it. Then uh, after that, your portfolio as performance will mirror uh, the portfolio that I set up and that I manage, and I'll do the work and you can just uh, share in the performance. If you haven't liked and subscribed already, I would appreciate you doing that. It helps me get the algorithm out there. Uh, thanks to all the guys that have subscribed. Really appreciate it. Love the comments uh, and the discussion. A disclaimer, of course, as I said at the start, this is just my opinion and my views. It's not advice. I'm not an advisor. I'm not your advisor. And so I don't know what your circumstances may be and what may or may not be appropriate for you. So please uh, use your common sense, use your discretion, make sure that you um, treat this as a, an opinion piece only and that you take responsibility for your own decisions. And I look forward to catching up with you in another video. Wish you all the best and we'll talk soon. Cheers.